this story called The Boy Who Doesn't. The Boy Who Didn't Know How to Recognize a King. Um, I sold it to a literary magazine called A Literate. And uh, when I first signed up to do this presentation, um, A Literate told me it was going to be in the spring 2018 issue and that it would be online. And I was hoping that by the time we got here today and I stood in front of you, I would be able to tell you that if you want to read the whole story, you can find it online at the Aliterate website. And I can't tell you that because it's not up yet, even though summer began two days ago. So I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the, what's going on there. The table of contents of the spring issue are up and uh, my story is listed in the table of contents but there's no link to actually read the story. I expect there will be at some point so if you want to read the entire story that would be how to do it although I can't tell you when that's going to happen. We'll just have to see. Um, and uh, what I have done with this story is I have taken a traditional Cambodian folk tale and uh, retold it. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room is conversant with Cambodian history and literature. There's another department we might want to think about <laughs> um, adding to, to Signum, but um, for, for me, um, I, I don't have any formal training in Cambodian history or literature. Uh, for me, when I was in graduate school, which was a few summers ago, there was um, an influx of refugees from Southeast Asia. This was in the early 1980s. And um, many refugees were resettled in the neighborhood that I lived in in Philadelphia at the time. And I got involved with helping teach English to um, some of these new, newly arrived refugees. And I got um, kind of emotionally attached to one particular Cambodian family. And we're still in touch to this day. Um, many years later, um, and uh, this led to me raising a Cambodian foster son who was an unaccompanied minor refugee, and uh, I learned the Cambodian language. I even learned how to read the Cambodian alphabet. I am not as good at it as I used to be. Uh, when I was in my prime, I could read Cambodian folk stories in the original language. Um, this particular story I did not read in the original language. It has been translated into English. But uh, I have some understanding of Cambodian history and culture, and uh, I, I intend, you know, my, my intent of writing this is to kind of share that, share some of that with uh, the English language world. Uh, the original folk tale that this is based on is called "The King and the Buffalo Boy," and uh, I don't have time to read the whole story. As I said, someday. <laughs> If you're, if you're interested, someday you'll be able to read the whole story online, I think, I hope. Um, but I'm going to read the first um, five pages of the story and then talk about it a little bit, okay? Long ago, in the days of the Khmer Empire, the common folk believed that the very monsoons blew at the emperor's command, bringing both the rain that caused life to burst forth from the soil and the winds that swept whole villages into oblivion. And so it was that the common folk feared to draw the eye of the emperor upon themselves, lest he be displeased with them, and yet feared more his disregard, which was a subtler but no less certain form of ruin. Such is the way with emperors. But no emperor, not even the great Jayavarman VII of legend, could know what went on in every corner of the empire. And so the empire was divided into provinces, each ruled by its own king. Some kings might be little more than imperial puppets, others ruled freely. No king in the empire ruled more freely than the wizard king Suvanaro, for he was clever and sly, wise in wizardry and kingcraft both. His province, Stung Treng, was distant from the imperial capital. And so long as the emperor received his regular tributes, Suvana wrote, might rule as he pleased. But there were other ways in which a king's will could be thwarted, as Suvana wrote would learn, much to his regret. One day, King Suvana wrote was hunting 
in the thick and sparsely populated jungle along the Mekong River. Hunting was the king's only respite from the demands of the court, with its endless stream of judgments to be rendered and supplicants to be heard. Yet when he hunted, he must bring along at least his son, Prince Prana, the Lord Chamberlain, the court wizard, even a wizard king needs a court wizard, <laughs> and the captain of the guard, who would in turn bring a few fives of soldiers for the king's and the prince's safety. But what pleased the king most was to withdraw even from this small retinue and track quarry on his own. The captain of the guard was never happy when the king went into the jungle alone, and the court wizard would insist on casting a spell of seeming on the king, so that if anyone came across him hunting alone in the jungle, they would take him for a common villager and not know that they had found a king undefended. The king treasured these moments. They were the only times he could be alone and at peace. He seldom returned to his hunting companions with game, but always in better spirits. On this particular day, Subana Ro had found a silver pheasant and tracked it back to its nest. As the bird settled onto her eggs and began preening, the king crept toward her on his belly, his bow and a single arrow in his left hand. The perfume of the dark earth was heavy in his nostrils. Finding cover behind the broad leaves of a palm shrub, he rose to his knees, slid the knock of the arrow into the bowstring and drew. He took aim, holding his breath as the captain of the guard had taught him, and shot. At that same instant, a peasant boy appeared. He lunged toward the nest, chasing the hen. He had meant to collect her eggs, but the king's arrow now flew straight for his heart. To kill a child was very bad karma. For a wizard, it might mean the loss of his hard-won powers, perhaps forever. The king acted quickly. He shouted a word in Sanskrit, the sacred tongue of magic, and the arrow faded into shadow. Pain lanced through the king's body. A spell invoked and released so quickly created backlash. It would be a day or more before the king would be able to cast another. Still, better a day than a lifetime. The king fell to the ground, gritting his teeth as he waited for the pain to pass. The boy paused for a moment to brush at the strange tickling sensation on his chest, then, dealt, then knelt and began to gather the eggs, placing them in a small sack. He seemed about 14 years old, same age as the prince, though he was unmistakably of coarser stock, short and thin, dressed in nothing more than sandals and a dirty sarong around his hips. Long strands of unkempt black hair framed a scarred face. The king could see welts on his bare brown skin. He looked up as the king approached. Who are you? the boy asked. I might ask you the same. What are you doing here? I live here, the boy replied indignantly. What are you doing here? You didn't see the king's soldiers? It is their task to keep village folk away from this place. The boy looked at him blankly. The king's anger rose. You are small and ignorant. Then he remembered the spell. To the boy, the king was no more than another of the village folk himself. And that gave him an idea for a little joke. What's your name, he asked, in a calmer, friendlier voice. Knock, replied the boy. Very well, Knock. Would you like to meet the king? The boy stood. All right. The king and his hunting party are not far from here. I can take you to them. Subana Rope began to walk and gestured for him to follow. The boy hurried to catch up. But how will I know? Which one is the king? All are required to kneel in the presence of the king. When we find the king's party, you will see everyone kneel but one. The one who does not kneel is the king. Do you understand? Nock nodded as he listened. I understand. Subana wrote, led the boy back to the clearing where he had left the others. At once, the entire party fell to their knees before Subana wrote. The boy looked around, taking in the scene. Now do you see who is king? The king asked. He waited for the boy to fall to his knees in terror as he realized the enormity of his mistake. 
the boy gave the king a mild look and said, I see that we are both kings. <laughs> the king felt the familiar rage rise again. What? The boy waved his hand at the courtiers. They are all kneeling. Only you and I stand. <laughs> so you and I must be kings. I'm going to stop there because that's the original folk story. That, that, the other 80%, <laughs> the other 80% of my story comes from me, but that is the original story. Um, it, it's typical of a Cambodian folk story. Um, you do not find stories about heroes going out to slay dragons in Cambodian folklore. What you mostly find in Cambodian folklore are stories about somebody who's too big for themselves getting um, the, the air let out of them by someone more humble than they are. Uh, so this is a very typical story. I'm not an expert on folklore, but I once talked to someone who was. Um, she didn't know anything about Cambodian folklore, but we, we, um, I raised the subject with her and, and we discussed this. And uh, her specialty was Eastern European folklore. And she said the same thing is true in Eastern Europe. And she thought it was because it was a village culture in Eastern Europe. People live in small communities that are isolated by forests from other communities. And so you don't, you don't in that environment, you don't get stories about great heroes. You get stories about ordinary people reminding each other that they're ordinary people. And she speculated that Cam Cambodia is a similar situation with people in, in traditional Cambodia, with uh, people living in some small isolated villages and that a, a similar sort of, uh, of uh, um, flavor of folklore would arise from that. So uh, from a, from a mythopoetic point of view, um, the big problem for me as a writer is that's not a story, <laughs> but I just read to you. That is not a complete story as we, in our world today, in, in our culture, would define a story that you might hope that a magazine might want to buy and publish. Um, so my, uh, my challenge in applied mythopoetics is to take that as the, the germ of the story and, and then develop it. Um, it occurs to me that the in, in our folklore of our culture, the story that, in my mind, most reminds me of this one is the emperor's new clothes. And uh, you know, by a coincidence, just a couple months ago, there's a, a theater um, theater company in the town where I live, um, and my wife and I buy season tickets every year to their shows, and they do a children's show every year. And this year, they happen to do a um, theater adaptation for kids of The Emperor's New Clothes. And we went to see it, and I was struck by the fact that they, their solution to this problem, because they, like, you know, like my story, The Emperor's New Clothes is not enough to sustain an entire play, right? Um, their solution was the same as mine, which in a nutshell is you start, you know, you, you, you start with the, this as the root of your story, but um, it ends up with the, um, the emperor and the boy who called him out on his clothes becoming friends and allies and partners in, in rule. And that's how my story ends also. And so I was struck by the parallel that we came up with the same answer to the question of how to, how to, um, how to build this out into a story because it occurs to, to me and I guess to them too that if you are a ruler, the one thing you really need is somebody you can trust give it to you straight to tell you how it really is and not try to flatter you. So I guess that's the end of what I had for um, in terms of prepared talk. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? How do Cambodians treat the magic, generally speaking? Because in that seems very everyday. Like, that wasn't the point of the story, <laughs> which we would kind of anticipate in our folklore that the use of magic would be well, the original story doesn't have any magic in it. <laughs> I did that. I did that. Um, um, but the magic isn't, um, 
the magic isn't integral to the story. Uh, but I, it, it's, uh, well, I mean, it's part of the story, but as I said, the original story doesn't require it at all. And, you know, my, um, I, I once heard Michael Swanwick, the, the writer my, Michael Swanwick talk, and, and he said something that always stuck with me. Is he did, you can tell a story about a wizard who can summon a dragon at will and never explain how that is, as long as the dragon is not the solution to the problem. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I learned a lot about how to write fantasy from that, from, from that one observation. And, uh, you know, the, um, and I, I followed that rule in my story. My, our, the king is a wizard. He casts spells throughout the story but the spells he casts have nothing to do with his problem, which as it develops from the point where I left off, um, he wants to change, he, 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 this king punishes evildoers in his kingdom by changing them into animals based on the severity of the crime. And he's so angry at this boy, he wants to change him into a dung beetle, which is the nastiest thing he can think of. But as you heard in this, I, I, you know, I, I established in the story that in the course of saving the boy's life, he temporarily lost his ability. So he has to take the boy back to the palace and wait for the ability to come back. And when he comes back, he still can't do it, and he doesn't understand why. And so that's the, the, um, the conflict that moves the story forward from there, and eventually well, you got to read it. <laughs> Eventually it works out. But magic does not solve the problem of the story. So, Yes? Go um, ahead. A phrasing that caught my attention was a few fives of soldiers. Yes. Um, so is, Why? is there a reason for that, <laughs> yeah. basically, is the question. There is a reason. Uh, I would... It's because there's something about the Cambodian language that interests me, and I still remember this. Here's how to count to ten in Cambodian. Mui, bi, be, bun, pram. Pram mui, pram bi, pram be, pram bun, do. Um, it's not exactly a base five system, but it kind of is, and when you count on your fingers, it's obvious how it, how it developed. Um, and so I said a few fives of soldiers because I was trying to get some of the flavor of yeah. that into the story. Um, it's, it's a really interesting language. Um, it, Cambodian is, or Khmer, or more properly. Khmer is one language in the Mon Khmer language group, which is a small language group in Southeast Asia. <coughs> the other languages in the group are all languages spoken by small ethnic minorities within other countries. Um, Khmer, the Khmer language is the only language in the language group that is the official language of a sovereign nation, Cambodia. Um, it is not related to any of the languages around it. It's sort of like Finnish in that regard. It's not related to Lao or Vietnamese or Chinese or Thai. And one of the reasons I like it is it's not a tonal language. <laughs> Chinese and Vietnamese and Thai and Lao are all tonal languages, and I have never been able, I have tried, I have never been able to get the ear for the tones and be able to pronounce the tones correctly. And so, like, when I first found out Cambodian wasn't tonal, you know, I, I was, they said I was teaching English to Southeast Asian refugees who spoke various languages. When I found out Cambodian wasn't tonal, I said, thank God, now teach me how to speak it. <laughs> I think maybe I can do this one. <laughs> um, it, is, it is actually, um, one of its roots is in Sanskrit. I mentioned Sanskrit. Uh, Sanskrit relates to Cambodian much in the same way that Greek or Latin relates to English, and that the language does not, is not derived from Sanskrit, but the um, sacred texts of Hinduism and Buddhism are written in Sanskrit, and so Sanskrit's part of the culture, and there are <coughs> many Sanskrit loan words in Cambodian, especially for technical terms. Like the Cambodian word for telephone comes from Sanskrit. Just like our word for telephone comes from Greek, even though English is not, not a Greek, not derived from Greek. Cambodian folklore, because 
there are, are a lot of folklore cultures that don't focus on the children as much. Um, so I was wondering if that was something normal. Um, and then also, I'm curious about how uh, knowing the background of the culture um, influenced the way that you wrote the additional parts of the story. Like, like for example, the, the counting by fives. What were some other elements that you found yourself? Oh, I need to incorporate this part of these quirks or what of these uh, characteristics. Well, one of the, one of the things, to answer your second question first, um, one of the things I did, I don't know if you noticed the lengths of the names, mm -hmm. that's very Cambodian. I, I, I workshopped this story once with a, in a writer's group, and one of the um, other members of the group complained to me that the, the names of the characters didn't seem like they belonged in the same culture because you have a little boy, not a little, a teenage boy named Nock on the one hand and a king named Subana Rok. But that's how it is in Cambodian culture. The, the more important you are, the bigger your name is. And that ordinary people have one syllable names and royalty have four syllable names and there's a sliding scale. <laughs> Um, so I, all I could say to her is, I'm sorry, I can't fix that because that's how it is. Um, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. But the, the other question was about children. I don't know, I, from my experience reading the stories, I don't know that that's true. Um, in this particular story, the child sort of represents honesty and, and humility and down, a down-to-earth attitude. Um, you, you know, there's, there's always somebody in <laughs> these stories that has that kind of attitude, but not necessarily a child. Pine Leaf? Yeah, I was wondering then if this tendency to have longer names for more and more people is sort of equivalent to how in our culture, especially in noble culture, you know, in the traditional European culture where the higher your rank was, the more names you had. For example, the average prince seems to be born with about five or six different names yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm suppo I suppose it's similar, yeah. Um, Cambodian, we have, we have a couple minutes, yeah, right? Yeah. We've, we've um, one of the things that intrigues me about Cambodian is, um, as opposed to um, European languages, is European la Cambodian doesn't have any tenses, right? Ah. Uh, Cambodian, um, <laughs> it doesn't have any something? tenses, it doesn't have any conjugations. Um, so, uh, but what it does have, is 80 different ways to say you, <laughs> the second person <laughs> singular pronoun, wow. depending on the relationship between the speaker and the person being addressed. Uh, my foster son said to me once, that's because Westerners are all about process and people in the East are all about relationships. Hmm. So uh, European languages emphasize who did what to whom and why, when they did it. And Eastern languages um, are far focused on what's my relationship to you, the person I'm speaking to. So it's a real, it's a real challenge in Cambodian when you address somebody to pick the right word <laughs> to address them by and not, not be offensive. Um, you know, we Americans struggle with the fact that some European languages have two ways <laughs> of saying you. And I, you know, but learning Cambodian helped me understand that because <laughs> because two's a snap after you've dealt with eighty, right? But the thing I never got before, as a as an American, as an English speaker, with the, with the you know the, the two, the polite and formal. You know, some, sometimes when they teach you one of these languages to an, teach one of these languages to an English speaker, they emphasize you always use the formal. If you know, or when in doubt, use the formal because it could be insulting to use the familiar when you ought to be using the formal. But one of the things I, I, I grasped from doing this is that it can be insulting to use the formal to, to a person who's expecting the familiar. Because, because that's a way of saying, wait a minute, we're not, you know, we're not, as, we're not as close as you thought we were. You know, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not ready to be buddies with you just yet. Hold on a second. That can, that can be um, aloof and off-putting. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm I'm old. Um, I, you know, my 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 sense is that even in the European languages, the familiar is becoming very very common, and, and the formal is disappearing in, in in 
modern society where we all address each other by first names and, and formalities are, are becoming less common. Anybody else have any questions? Or? Well, I mean, I, there's more time. Uh, <laughs> nobody else has got questions. Uh, this translation thing is really interesting to me. Um, what Have you done translation of stories yourself? Like, you, did you say that this was translated by someone this, else that this, you used? Yeah, or? this particular one, I, I first learned the story from an English language translation. Um, I have read some of them in the original. There are some stories I think have not yet been translated okay. into English. And yes, the thought has crossed my mind, maybe. Yeah. Especially, I sold this one. Yeah. <laughs> and that, it was with this work. So um, may, you know, maybe, maybe that's something I ought to try doing, but I haven't yet. So what do you find with these different words communicating these concepts that just are not familiar to, to the English world? How, how would you go about translating these 80 different types of views? Like what, what would you have to do in the story, do you think, to communicate all of these nuances that are probably integral to the story that are just, you know, what do you do it's with that? It's a challenge. It's I would a challenge. even this story would have like some funny moments of, uh, you know, the, the boy not recognizing the king and using the wrong you. Right. And, like, is that something, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's always a challenge, and that's where that's where you know the, the artist and the creativity comes into play. In a sense, and I'm, I'm sure some of you already know this. That there's a there's a proverb in Italian, um, traditore traditore, which means to translate is to betray. That in some sense, you're you're never going to get it right. You're 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 always going to miss some you know miss some element in the original or change something to not not accurately reflect the original. You can't help it because languages don't. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence in the words. You can, you'll never get it perfectly. Um, you know, I, all you can do is do the best you can and, and be creative when there's no easy solution. Yeah, well, you see that where he kind of like calls, calls him buddy. Like, hey, buddy, like, we're the only two that are standing. Like, so instead of like using a different you, Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Friend. Pat. Like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, guy. Like, whatever it is. Or most royal highness. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different words for you. Other ones for, like, like, like we, like, me and you, reference the relationship relative to them. Like, referring, saying, you're saying, referring to we between two people who are equal. Would, be like, would that be a different word then? There's only one word for we, as far as I know. But it's, huh. um, um, and I think I, I say I say you. Um, the words, the the, the, the when you, when you're addressing someone more formally, you might call them lo, which might, in English might mean like sir. They, they use, you know they'll use it like a pronoun. Like um, does does sir have a minute to help help me with this problem? You know, but. It's, it's like that, and within within family relationships, um, of course, there's there's more words. There's you know separate words for big big brother and little. Well, and interesting. There's a sep there are separate words for big older sibling and younger sibling. There are not separate words for male sibling and female sibling. Huh. So it's not like Chinese in that because they have separate words for male and female, and older and younger. Right. They just have words for older and younger, long and prong. But if, if you can, if you want to be specific, you have to say, or bong and ong, bong pra means male big brother, and bong sre means female big brother, because, you know, so you, ha you have to use the adjective for male or female if you're, if you're being specific. Um, but you, so when you're speaking informally to someone, you might address them as bong for big brother or ong for little brother. And then you know, the, or, or little sibling, big little sibling, whether whether it's a man or a woman you're addressing, but there's a different word depending on the per the person is older than you or younger than you. So you're going to have to make a snap judgment. <laughs> would it be more Would it be more appropriate <laughs> to use the word for older or younger? That could be dicey right yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and if there's a significant Which is less risky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get if the person's a lot older than you, you should use the word for uncle or aunt. 
Okay, and if the person's a lot younger than you, you should use the word for niece or nephew. But again, like, should I ask this woman as big sister or as aunt? Right. That could be a delicate, that could be a delicate problem. <laughs> Two more minutes. Okay, anyone else? All right, well, I guess that's the end then. Thank you, everybody, for being such a good audience.